Good morning, my name is Clint Jernigan, and typically I'm upstairs on Sunday mornings with the middle and high school students. I am one of the youth pastors on staff, the youth director and missions director here at Community Life. And so this is exciting to, uh, to be downstairs. <clears throat> I was telling my wife yesterday, I was like, hey, babe, uh, I get to go downstairs and go to big church, you know? And she's like, oh, that's cool. Like, I'm excited that you're, you're getting to preach on Sunday. I was like, yeah, me too. She goes, well, well who are you filling in for? Oh, I'm filling in for Jen. And at that, she lost. She was so frustrated. She's like, I love hearing Jen speak. I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you, babe. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks. I feel the support and love. That's awesome. Uh, and speaking of support and love, Jen, we love and support you, and our, our prayers go out to you as well, because you are awesome. So is our pastor, Scott and Tammy, and the whole Verano crew. So since they're not here to embarrass, let's give them a big round of applause. Uh, we love you guys. We thank you all. <clears throat> they are tremendous, and we love them. Scott and Tammy are cool, but I tell you what, it gets even more awesome as you go down to Nate and Micah. Uh, they are the true amazingness in that family, and I get a chance to work with them. How cool is that? <clears throat> uh, here at Community Life, uh, we believe in a practical faith. We believe that, uh, that when we learn something out of the Bible, that we put it to action. So over these past few weeks, we've been learning uh, in this series called Loving Life, just about how Jesus went out and did life and loved those people that he had encounters with, healing people. And, and teaching people and praying with people and just taking care of people out of love. So out of the past four weeks, we've been studying this, and today is the last of this series. But if you remember from last week, Scott talked about a story out of Luke chapter 7, when Jesus was invited to a dinner uh, with, uh, at a Pharisee's house. And in the middle of dinner, a lady kind of came in and interrupted things. And, uh, and she came in and began washing Jesus' feet with her tears and wiping his feet with her hair and kissing his feet and anointing them, pouring oil on his feet. And everybody kind of at the, at the dinner were thinking kind of the same thing, like, what is happening? This is, this is a strange occurrence. If it seems strange now, it would have also been strange then. And actually, some of the people there at the dinner said kind of amongst themselves, they're like, if this guy was actually a prophet, talking about Jesus, if this guy were actually a prophet, then he would know what kind of woman she is insinuating that he would put a stop to this if he knew that she was a sinner. He would absolutely stop this, this beautiful act, send her away, and they could get on with their nice little dinner. But this is not what Jesus does, right? Remember from last week, instead, he looks at her and he says, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Of course, totally shocked everybody there. We're going to look at a similar story today from the book of Mark. Mark was written by a guy named Mark. It's kind of, kind of easy to remember. Thank you for laughing at that. Appreciate it. That was the dad joke. <clears throat> uh, Mark was written, um, we, we believe, uh, one of the, or the first accounts of Gospel of Jesus, uh, written somewhere around 50 AD. Um, for all of you taking notes, that's 50 AD. And uh, he was probably the first one to write it. And then the other ones, Matthew, Luke, and John, would have written theirs uh, after that. And Mark was not one of the original 12 disciples. Uh, however, he was a close friend of Peter. And Peter, in actually one of his books titled First Peter, because there were multiple, Peter says, uh, refers to Mark as my son, kind of highlighting the close friendship relationship that they had. Mark also went on missionary journeys with Paul and with Barnabas and some of these other leaders in the early church. So we see Mark around at this. And in his writings, we hear the, uh, the urgency of his writing. And we don't get a whole lot of theology, not a lot of deep mystical thoughts, but instead Mark cuts straight to the point and pretty much just tells us exactly what Jesus did out of love. So in this story from Mark chapter 5 that we are going to read today, uh, this is during a time where Jesus already called the disciples to him, and he has his, his squad, right, his 12, his crew, and he and the rest of the, uh, the band of men and women who were kind of traveling from town to town, healing people and teaching people, would have definitely caused a crowd whenever they showed up into your village. And this is exactly the scene that we find in Mark chapter 5, verse 21. It says this, When Jesus had crossed over again by boats to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him while he was still by the sea. One of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came out, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, and he kept begging him 
My little daughter is at death's door. Come and lay your hands on her so she can get well and live. So Jesus went with him, and a large crowd was following and pressing against him. And a woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years had endured much under many doctors. She had spent everything she had and was not helped at all. On the contrary, she became worse. Having heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his robe, for she said, if I can just touch his robes, I will be made well. Instantly, her flow of blood ceased, and she sensed in her body that she was cured of her affliction. At once, Jesus realized in himself that power had gone out of him. He turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my robes? His disciples told him, you see the crowd pressing against you, and you say, who touched me? So he was looking around to see who had done this. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came with fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be free from your affliction. So in the middle of... Jesus traveling from one place to another in, a, in what probably seemed like a busy schedule of I'm going to go over here and, and heal a bunch of people and, and talk to them about what the kingdom of God looks like, teach them about love and loving their neighbors, and we're going to go over here and kind of do the same. Um, Jesus landed on the shores of the sea, immediately surrounded by a crowd of people. And it was in this crowd when people were probably uh, making several requests to Jesus that Jairus, one of the leaders of the synagogue, the church, the little local church there, came up and just pleaded with Jesus And in this moment, he probably relayed the most anguishing, painful, gut-wrenching, terrifying situation that a loving father could possibly be in. He said, my little daughter is on, in his words, death's doorstep. I I can't imagine. As a dad of two little girls, this would have absolutely been a challenging situation, to say the least. Do we know this? Do we know the same thing that Jairus knew? That when he came and fell at the feet of Jesus in a plea of absolute heartbreak, he came to Jesus and said, you can do something about this. And he fell at his feet. And he publicly in that moment proclaimed that Jesus was the one who could heal him. Do we know this? Do we fall at the feet of Jesus and surrender and beg him to intervene in our families? in our relationships, in our finances? Do we beg Jesus, knowing that he is the one who can make all things right, to be a part of these situations? Do we display our trust and our faith in Jesus? So, of course, Jesus agrees and goes with Jairus, and as they're traveling again with this crowd, and it's probably hot and dusty and just a a little bit of chaos inside of this situation— is when we see the story shift and a new character comes on the scene, right? A lady who we find out a lot about in a little amount of time. Have you ever been in a waiting room before? And uh, maybe a doctor's office or, or maybe wherever, someplace wonderful like the DMV, and you're waiting there next to someone and they just spill their whole life story to you in about three minutes, And you're thinking, TMI, dude. Like, I do not need to know this much about your life, but this is what Mark shares with us about this lady's affliction. And she has tried everything to become well, and nothing has helped. In fact, it only got worse. And now she's broke. I bet some of us in this family room today might feel like this right now, that we've tried everything that we can think of and there's still no change to our situation, still no light, maybe at the end of the tunnel, and what we're doing just doesn't seem to be working. But here are four words that, that stood out to me on this page, <clears throat> and it's this. Having heard about Jesus. This lady's never met him before, we don't think. But Jesus has this reputation traveling from town to town. He's healing people. He's teaching people. 
He's rescuing people. He's restoring people. And having heard about Jesus, she has this hope that is inside of her that maybe now is the day that she can become healed. I can get a picture of her kind of jostling and struggling and trying to get to the center of the, the hub of the cra- crowd and chaos, and she reaches out, right? She says to herself in, in the verse in Mark that she reaches out saying to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be made well. I will be healed. Why is this detail important to us? And why does she believe that just touching Jesus' robe will help? Now, if you will, just for a second, let me geek out. Let me nerd out on Bible stuff for just a minute, okay? And I swear I'll come back real quick, so just bear with me for a moment. So she, being a a Jewish lady in a Jewish town, uh, would have been aware of the, uh, of the, the prophecies, aware of what we call now the Old Testament. And what she is doing in this moment is she is referring back to something that she has known to be true from Malachi, which is a, a book in the Old Testament, uh, chapter 4, when the prophet says, and the Messiah will come with healing in its wings. <clears throat> Think, okay, I'm not really seeing this. Like, Jesus is not a bird. Like, this doesn't make much sense. So, this is where I geek out. One minute. So, the word in Hebrew for wings is also the same word in Hebrew as corner, right? In Luke's telling of this story, he adds the little tidbit that she reaches out and touches his tassel, like on his robe, on his prayer shawl that he would be wearing as a, as a good Jewish rabbi that Jesus would have been wearing. And she reaches out and touches the tassel, which is on the corner, now, let me, let me land this plane. You're like, you're, you're out there somewhere, dude, and I can't track with you. Let me land this plane. So this lady who was afflicted for 12 years, who had tried everything else to become healed, whose finances were in shambles, who knew the scriptures and the prophecies about the coming Messiah, and who had hope that Jesus was the one who could save and rescue her, she is the one who reached out in the crowd and with her actions declared that Jesus is this Messiah because the Messiah is coming with healing in his wings. She touched because she knew that he could heal her. And you know what? It worked, right? Like Maybe to her surprise, probably not. It worked. And we, we read that immediately she was healed, but she was not the only one who realized this. It's interesting that, that Mark adds, Jesus felt power leaving his body and that's when he said, oh, whoa, whoa, time out. Something happened. Like, who just touched my robes? And, and we see the, uh, the disciple, <clears throat> the disciples kind of turn to each other, and they're like, I, uh, I don't have any. Do you have any? I don't know who. Like, everybody is probably the correct answer because everybody's trying to, and there's this crazy, dusty mob parade thing that is traveling down the road to this Jairus guy's house. I, uh, we don't have an answer for you. So Jesus just stops in this moment, <clears throat> and he's just kind of scanning the crowd. He's looking at people in their eyes. He's trying to figure it out. And humbly and brokenly, it said, terrified and frightened, this lady steps forward. I mean, I can't imagine what this lady would be feeling in this moment. Thinking that she had done and stealing a healing, right? (laughs) She had come and robbed Jesus of this thing. Now, when Jesus says, who touched me, he doesn't do it from like a, a place of anger. He's not like, who stole my wallet, right? Like somebody just in this situation. No, instead he said, I want to know who just believed enough in me. And so she comes forward and she's like, it it was me. And she tells him the whole story. Again, broken and terrified in this situation. And I imagine that she was feeling some of the same things that the woman from last week's story was feeling as well. Remember the question that Jesus asked Simon the, the Pharisee last week when Jesus said, do you see this woman? I mean, obviously he saw her. Do you see this woman? And I can picture her kind of looking up at him. And she too was ashamed and outcast in fear of what was going to happen next. And in this this lady's life in Mark 5 today, Jesus knowing her and looks at her in the middle of the noise of the crowd, amongst the jostling and the dust, amongst this crazy situation, 
He looks at her, and he sees a beloved daughter. He's not mad. He's not upset. He wants to know her. His words to her are, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be free from your affliction. He has the opportunity to bless her fully and publicly, to restore her, to tell her that she is not an interruption to his day, that she is a loved member of his family, that there is always time for her, and that her faith in God has forever changed her life. You see, if she had just reached out and touched Jesus, been healed in her body and slipped away, her body would have still been healed, right? But perhaps she would have lived the rest of her life thinking inside, I just stole a miracle, like I just stole something, and God is probably angry or upset with me. But I was at my last bit of rope. But instead, Jesus loves her and is able to restore her. Now, you, you're probably wondering what happened to Jairus and his daughter, because there was the, the interruption there on the way to Jairus' house. Jairus' daughter died. But don't freak out. Don't worry. That story does not end sadly, because death is too small of an opponent for our God. Ooh, that'll preach. <laughs> it's so... Thank you for laughing. <clears throat> You see, Jesus brought her back to life and therefore further proving that the very first interruption to Jesus' day was still met with love and healing and restoration and compassion. So what does this mean for us today? Again, at Community Life, we believe that when we read the scripture, when we encounter Jesus, that it doesn't allow us to stay the same, that we are changed. It changes who we are and the way we act. We say upstairs a lot with the students, I can do any what with a big enough why. For God so loved the world, why, that he did what? He gave his only son so that we could have life. So what does this mean for us today? I'll tell you. And if you've been here in our family room, and maybe you took a nap, or you're watching online or listening on the podcast and there's been like 17 notifications pop up on your phone and the FedEx guy has knocked on the door. I get it. Tune in to this word that he has for you today. You are not an interruption to God. You are not an interruption to God. He loves you. When you reach out in faith and declare that he is the Messiah, that he is the saving one, that he is your rescuer and redeemer, he calls you his son or his daughter, and he wants to see you face to face and he can heal you and restore you. The second and final thing is this. Be aware of the beautiful interruptions in your life. We don't often plan the experiences that shape our lives the most. We don't often plan the experiences that shape our lives the most. So be aware of the things that seem like interruptions to your schedule, but could be an opportunity for you to bring healing and restoration to someone or offer the opportunity to simply add value to someone around you by letting them know that they are more important than your schedule. I'm talking to you as much as I'm talking to me, y'all. Now, I'm sure your kids... <clears throat> are angels, and they never bicker and fight about things at the house. Um, I have two daughters who are awesome, uh, Shorty, who's six, and Alaire Bear, who's three, and sometimes they like the same thing at the same time. Is this an anomaly, or is this all of us? Okay. Um, where they will start fighting over a toy, or maybe a Disney princess dress that they both want to wear, or maybe the, like the last cookie or food, or, or whatever. And in those moments, <clears throat> I, uh, we have this saying in our house, and I'll, I'll kind of get down on one knee, and I'll pull Ansley <clears throat> Shorty over to me, and I'll say, hey, baby, finish this statement. I love my sister more than my... And she'll kind of hit that. She'll kind of roll her eyes and be like, stuff. You know, like, <laughs> I know, I know, Dad, I know. And I'll say, okay, let's say that a few times. I love my sister more than my stuff. Because if we love someone, we can, we can do anything for them, right? If we elevate our love for our neighbors more than what we value, then 
the world can be changed and we get a better perspective on this. So maybe we can take this same idea that I share with my six and three-year-old in a minute to us in this situation this week and we can say, I love my neighbor more than my schedule. I had a lady uh, after the last service came out and she's like, you stepped on my toes (laughs) when you said that. I said, I'm sorry. She said, no, it's good. I feel like we need to know that. Moms, dads, Grandparents, when we're running the roads at Mach 5 on Highway 98, trying to get babies to piano practice and in school, we're trying to get to soccer practice and all these 90 other things that our kids are involved with, we feel like a taxi service. Be aware of those beautiful interruptions in our lives and know that you are greatly loved by God. Now go and let's love others the same way. Let's pray. Daddy God, we love you, and there is no doubt that you love us. God, you bring us to your side, and you call us your children, that we are not interruptions to you, but God, you are the one who heals and restores, and all of this is done out of love. So God, I pray that this week you would help us to have the eyes to see around us, See those opportunities for us to to bring healing, to add value to people. God, and just love our neighbors. And help us to love our neighbors more than we love our schedules. We love you. And it's your son's precious name we pray and all God's people said. We're going to sing one more last song. The altars will be open. And if I can pray with you about something, I'll be on the side here. And I'd love to do that. I think I figured out uh, the, the announcement that, that Kat forgot earlier, and that's okay. Um, you saw the third graders receive their Bibles earlier in the service, and that was such a beautiful moment. Um, Jen, who, who's not here with us today, thought, what a wonderful idea to share that with, with everybody else who, who may be in need of a new Bible or maybe in need of their very first Bible. If that's you today, 
uh, in Guest Central over here, we've got, I think, about 60 brand new Bibles that we bought uh, just because we thought that somebody in here today might need their very own Bible. So if that's you, we'd love to see you in Guest Central uh, and bless you with a Bible today. Would you stand and pray with me? Heavenly Father, we, we love you. And uh, we just thank you for, for allowing us to be a part of your, of your greater story that is literally unfolding around us each and every day. God, that you uh, live through us, not around us. That you, you, you allow us to, uh, to do the things that you allow us to do. God, we pray that uh, today that these Bibles would be a blessing to anyone, anyone who may receive them. God, we pray that uh, the pages in these Bibles would, would become tattered and torn from, from so much use and so much desire to know you better. God, take us from this place. Deliver us safely to our next. We love you and we thank you. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. You'll have a great week.